Wai kā te tua tāi kei te mihi atu ki te hau kāinga, tēnei te mihi a hikurangi ki a ngā puhi. Koutou i tuku mai te whakapono ki a mātou o te tai rāwhiti. Me te mihi anō ki a koutou ngā kai whakahaere o tēnei hui huinga, tēnā koe Sam, nā hau te karanga, koe da te take ko tāi mai au, tēnā koe, nei hana, tēnā koe i whakapuare tēnei wahanga, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, if you read my abstract, I wrote that a while ago. Uh, things have changed. Uh, <laughs> I'll try and stick to it. Um, it's based on my doctoral thesis that I wrote, in, well, it was published in 2000, so it was written in the 1990s, so that's where it's drawn from. You can read it online anyhow, so if there's more you want, um, go onto the Massey website and you'll find it there. Uh, but I'm 20 years out of the academ of academic circles, uh, and uh, I'm now writing fiction uh, as a historian. So uh, 2020, was it 2020? Yeah. Uh, during COVID, I, I began writing this novel uh, about, it's called Kawai, uh, and um, it's a trilogy. And right now I'm on the second book, about two-thirds of the way through, and I've just got up to the period where Christianity comes to, to these, these fictionalized people, except it's a true story. Um, it's, based, it's based on a lot of fact, uh, and it's pulled from um, my own, own area uh, within Ngāti Pro. And for you, those of you who don't know where that is, um, the eastern coast... Uh, well, the Waipu Valley is where the, I guess, the um, gospel was, uh, was born out of there for us or on the East Coast. And uh, I decided to write this novel series. I've been on the Waitangi Tribunal for many, many years, and I was quite despondent at the fact that um, you go and you hear claimant evidence and you really feel for uh, what's happened to different iwi in this country historically, and yet nobody really gets to hear about it unless you read the report that we write. And I, I thought, I've got to, before I leave this earth, make an attempt to try and get some of the material I've heard over the last 20 years out there. Uh, and I thought, non-fiction only reaches a certain audience. Uh, yeah. But that may be through... First fiction and getting something to the big screen uh, or television series, I could reach a, a much larger proportion of New Zealand and kind of educate us about our past uh, so that we, you know, um, the previous Prime Minister, Jacinda, she talked about um, nation building. And, and so that's what I'm on about. I'm using fiction to try and... Uh, build a better nation between the, uh, the races. Um, so, so that's what I'm doing at the moment. And I've been around the country uh, for the last couple of months doing a tour uh, of all the bookshops and all the writers' festivals talking about why I'm writing the series. Uh, and uh, I thought I'll pull from it today uh, because the first book, Really what I wanted to write about was the impact of colonisation on Māori society. Uh, but I thought, you can't do that until you really understand what Māori society was like before Captain Cook came here. And so that first book uh, really looks at that. Uh, and as I say, it, it's fictionalised, but when you read it, people know, I didn't make this stuff up. Uh, you can't have that good an imagination. Uh, so I, 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 couldn't, um, I couldn't write about any other iwi. I really couldn't even write about Ngāti Pro because, you know, there, there are always some people in there who wouldn't like that. I couldn't write about my own hapu even because I would offend people. So I went right back to my, only, my own family whakapapa line and I thought, right, my family's got my back. And, and, and I'll write this story that we know well uh, in our oral tradition and I'll bring it back down to today. So th that's what I've done. But in that, telling that story... I think any Māori who reads it will realise, hey, this could have been us. It, it doesn't matter where it takes place. This is our story too. We did the same things. We had the same experiences. So I'm going to pull from that, um, um, what I've been writing recently, and, but I, I'm going to come back to the, uh, what's in my, um, my abstract. 
So if you go back to, well, pre-1818 pretty much was all Māori on, on the East Coast. And in this book, it tells the story of a, a child that's born. Well, he's, his life is about avenging his grandfather's death. And I really wanted to convey to New Zealanders what utu meant to the old Māori. And this, this um, child, before he's born, um, his mother commits him in the womb to avenging his grandfather's death. Uh, and um, then he's born, and this, this story follows his life of how they train a warrior, how they make an, a, a, a nice little boy into a killing machine by the time he hits his 20s. And, uh, and then it follows his life on. He, he avenges, and uh, he does what he's born to do. But then when you've trained a man to only be that, he knows no, nothing else in his, in his later life. So the protagonist in the, in the novel is, you know, he's a flawed hero uh, when you look at him. But it touches on um, a whole lot of aspects of Māori society that I don't think we really appreciate. Um, we, we use the words, but we don't really know how deep these things go. Just a little bit about the East Coast, by the way. The terrain is different. Uh, so the, you know, the gospel story here in the north, it's not the same as the gospel story in our, in our area. And similarly for every other uh, iwi, you've got to remember Māori are tribal, and we've all got different stories. And there's some great stories about the Māori Christians who brought the gospel uh, to the different iwi, at the risk of their lives sometimes. Uh, and, and our story uh, revolves around a man named Piripito Mātākura, uh, who brought it to the East Coast. But it, uh, um, some of these concepts, muru, uh, which um, Sam mentioned, you know, there's a story in the book uh, about muru, about uh, a man taking a second wife, his chiefly wife's upset about that, and her family comes to exact a muru on, on him and his family. And uh, it, it was a way of balancing up uh, what they, con they perceived as a wrong. But it's, it can be quite brutal. But it was a way of uh, mending relationships. Uh, tapu. And I think this is one of the things about Christianity. Its ability to deal with tapu. In the Māori world, uh, you know, I think about when I was young, you wouldn't come out of a cemetery without washing your hands, uh, where I come from. Uh, and it was almost a psycho-spiritual thing. You know, because my uncle used to say to me, why do you wash your hands? Those are your own ancestors in there. Do you think they're going to harm you? And I said, yeah, I know that. But we do it all the time, and uh, I just I can't help myself, just in case. I'll throw some water over me. Uh, well, back in the old days, you could accidentally walk into an area that was a, an urupa where they put the tupawaku up in the trees, and they might mark it with uh, tie some hair around the trunk and you mistakenly walk in there, uh, and you didn't do it on purpose, but psychologically, you're affected by it, and you get sick from it. Uh, some people might say you cause your own sickness, and you might even die as a result. And Christianity brought the whole idea of being able to be redeemed, and that you could, there was a way out of this now when the Christian message was uh, first given, presented to Māori, when they debated it, here's a way for us uh, to protect ourselves from things like that. Utu, uh, I'll tell you a quick story in the book, true story, fictionalised into the book, uh, <laughs> where um, two warriors, chiefly warriors, meet in a, in, a, in a battle. One takes the other one prisoner, doesn't kill him, but castrates him. And... Uh, Later in another battle, should have killed him, he catches the culprit, has him brought down onto the beach, they dig a hole, bury him up to his neck in the sand, uh, and then he has his wife come out, and he's being fed as the chief, and he says to his wife to feed this chief who's in the ground. And so she mixes up kumara, uh, well, she mixed up for the chief kumara in water, but she urinates in front of him uh, in the kumara and mixes it. 
and she feeds him. And the chief, knowing that he's going to die, says, E tu, e tu, te ranga no hoki, te reka o tō kai. O tu, o tu, how sweet the taste of your food is. As Shakespeare would have put it, rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. And he swallows this because he knows that, okay, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be remembered forever by the statement I make that I, I didn't die a coward. Uh, and I tell that story uh, in the novel, uh, and I normalise throughout the novel lots of stories like that, so that by the time you get to the end of it, uh, kaitangata, cannibalism, killing, it's all acceptable to you. And in fact, you're even rooting for the protagonist by the end. You're, you're wanting him to kill that other tribe. Uh, uh, and, you know, it is done really well, but I don't know how I did it. Uh, but uh, that, that, that's, that's one of the stories in there. Uh, now you think about that. That, that that's, a normal, that's normal to try. If you're going to uh, balance the books, balance the ledger, and you're going to get vengeance, you're going to do it in a way that is equal to what happened to you. So he was castrated. What can I do to this guy that will at least equal that and, um, or, or, and more? Because that's the only way we're going to get balance. So you can imagine when you me telling you these stories, what the missionaries were up against when they got here uh, in terms of dealing with um, Māori and the way they thought. Kai tangata. Well, you know, for anybody who tells me that it didn't happen, um, I don't know what planet you're living on. You know, where I come from, we have places called Te Umu a Hinuturaha, Te Umu a Pākānui, Te Umu a Mea, Te Umu a Mea. And I used to ask my uncles, oh, what's that mean? Is that where Pākānui put a hangi down? Or is that where Hinuturaha put a hangi down? And they say, almost. <laughs> that is Hinuturaha's hangi. She was the food in it. And they're all over the place on the East Coast, uh, um, places like that. So, you know, it, it was common right up until on the East Coast, at least, till the uh, late 1830s. In fact, we say on the coast, Nā te hāhi i tangawatu te kiko tangata i akuniho. It was the church that took human flesh from my teeth. And if you wanted to start a, the Māori Battalion guys tell me this when I interviewed them, if you wanted to start a fight with another tribe when uh, they were drinking, that's all you had to say is, I had your tipunas flesh in my teeth. You can imagine what that would do. <laughs> On the other point I wanted to make about that period, pre-1818, the chief's word was final. And when everybody lived uh, close together, all he had to say was, this is what we're doing. Uh, and I know in, on, in the Waiapu, the big chief there at one time was <coughs> Uenuku. He died in 1840, just before the treaty was brought. And he had said that we are making peace with certain uh, iwi, and that was it, final. Nobody was going to go against that. So, the first intrusion by Europe on our coast was muskets, not brought by the park out to us, but brought to our, to our cousins up here, our Ngāpui relations. But I mihi to Ngāpuhi because it is through what happened that the gospel came to us, through our people being brought up here as prisoners or slaves, although that word doesn't really describe um, the relationship. So in 1818, Hungi Hika led the first um, forage into the East Coast, and our people did not know what a musket was. In fact, the chief at our pa called out, Haramaye na fa mamaku? And he was talking about the branch of the mamaku tree, long and brown and underneath it's silver. That's all they could relate, this, what they were seeing in terms of the pū, the pū tōriri. It looked to them like a, a, a mamaku branch. So bring your mamaku branches, see how they go against our mamaku branches, which they're talking about their taiaha. They had no idea of the power of these things. So you can imagine how quickly um, pā were overthrown in, in 1818. But only to a certain part of the East Coast. In 1821, Paul Mare came next. Uh, and then in 1823, Ngāti Wai, uh, some of our relations over in the Thames area came as allies. Uh, and um, it was pretty tough for our people. And the, estim the estimations there is that half the population was either killed or taken as uh, prisoners back north. And uh, it was only those who escaped into the hinterlands that survived it. But 
When Paul Murray came, as a, I believe he had a conversion of his own, a Christian conversion of his own, but he brought his wife back and wanted to make peace. And there's this great story of him sending Tao Tao Didi, uh, his warrior, with two women, uh, the one of which he had taken away and, and made his wife, and they walk into the heart of Ngāti Pro Whakawhitira Pā, the biggest pā, as I understand, in New Zealand. It was a mile long, on a flat, and these three people walk into the pā. You can imagine. It was like hungry dogs. Two and a half thousand warriors in that pā. That's going to eat this guy. And uh, he walked in, and all he had, he had a musket. He had a belt, and uh, uh, he had uh, a dress around his waist. And they, they say that he was an amazing looking person. Uh, but uh, it was a tataupaunamu. That's the way on the coast at least, that you, you made peace. You did it with women, so you signaled to your enemy, this is a peaceful mission. You can, you can kill this guy if you like, but first hear us out. And then in uh, 1823, Uenuku, um, on behalf of everybody, said we'll make peace with them. And from then on, there was a uh, interaction between the north and, and the east coast uh, up until the 1830s. There was no more fighting between them. Well, we had other iwi to deal with other than Ngāpui. Um, in 1833, so you have all these Ngāti Pro who are living up here as prisoners, slaves. Some are married in. They marry in during this period. But others get the opportunity to come here to pay here uh, to the mission school. And uh, over a 10-year period, some of them are educated uh, and they come to understand the Bible. Um, so I talked about warfare. It escalated in the 1820s. Um, there's some massive battles fought on the East Coast between tribes all over the North Island who came there. Uh, and uh, there was an escalation of warfare and disease because we had whalers visiting and our women were interacting with these whalers, and so diseases were coming on shore. And between those two, that's the reason why the uh, population was decimated. And then there was the head trade. A lot of people blame the missionaries for the stopping of tattooing of the head on males. A lot of our males, they, you were walking target in the, 19, in the 1820s if you were wearing a moko. Uh, and so a lot of the young men weren't keen to get one uh, in the 1820s. Not so much because of the missionaries, because of their own safety. So in the 1830s, get to the story of Tomatakura. In 1833, there's a whaling ship off the shore, of, of, off out from the Waiapu, and it's trading, and something goes wrong. The Captain Black, the, it's the Elizabeth, Elizabeth, says that the reason um, he took these people north was because the winds came up. Others say that some of his sailors had, um, had, hadn't come back. The short of it is he took a dozen high-profile rangatira people, men and women, from the Waiapu up, to, up here to Rangihaua, and he dropped them there and he carried on. And they were made uh, prisoners by some of the chiefs here, and the missionaries intervened and persuaded them. This is 1833, so people were starting to come around after the... The Christian missions had been here for two decades, were starting to come around, and they decided we'll let them go and we'll let them be returned if the missionaries returned them. So they had a crack at returning them at the end of the month in April, but they hit a squall off the Whorekaheka, off the East Cape, had to come back, and uh, they tried again in, in summer, in late December, 1833. So that gives you about eight months where these important people are here, and they were schooled by the missionaries. They go back. In uh, January 1834, they arrive at Whakawhitira. Remember, you've got everybody living together, 5,000 people in that pa uh, at any one time. And they turn up. Tomata Kura, who was caught by Hungi Hika, he's come back 15 years later almost. They had his funeral. They'd buried, they put a carving up for him. Can you imagine in the minds of these people, what is this? when the guy's turning back up, and these other people who were taken away that you thought were gone forever. And they turn up with Rich, uh, William Williams and William Yate, the two missionaries, and they come into Whakawhitira. It's not those two who preached the gospel to our people, it's this Piripito Matakura. 
And even William Williams says in his diaries, he said, despite our best efforts, they'll listen to them before they listen to us. And that's a very Māori thing. You have a Pākehā come to the East Coast now and he tries to sell some policy of the government. (laughs) But you bring a Māori with you who you trust, who's from your area, you're more inclined to listen to them. And so, you know, I I listen to our people today who say that, you know, colonisation, Christianity was the advance guard of colonisation and and we were colonised by Christianity. And I, I, you know, that's only happened in the last 10 or 15 years where you start to hear that because I think that demeans the intelligence of our people when you, when you say that we're hoodwinked by Christianity because the, as I understand everything I read, we chased the Christian message once we heard it because of it, we could relate to it. We had a lot of atua. We're spiritual people. Here's another one. We just need to uh, debate and size up where does this one fit in relation to to the others. I mean, the big challenge was the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. That was the big challenge for um, philosophers, for the intellectuals within Māori society. Anyway, the short of it is, Te Mātakura stays there, Williams comes back, he doesn't return for four years. In that four years, something happens, the gospel spreads basically from Whānau Apa in the Bay of Plenty right to Wairarapa on the east coast. And it comes down to a battle at Tukua Kuku in 1836, which is Takaha, uh, one of our um, age-old enemies with our cousins, Te Whānau Apunui, I mean really close cousins, and uh, Te Whānau Apunui sided with Ngāti Awa, um, Maitarangi, those here we gave support, Whakatohea, and on our side we had Ngāti Pau right down to Wairarapa, all those who connected to the Taki Timu Canoe. We're going to have it out once and for all uh, in 1836, the summer of 1836, we're going to do it here. Now, you take your tohunga along to a war. In this case, they asked Te Mātākura, well, we want you to come along and bring the power of your atua, and we'll see how he fears, you know, that atua fears for us. So they get there, he preaches on the day of the battle, and he says to all the army, he says, Whakarerea, whakarerea, ngā atua Māori, kia kotahi te atua mō tātou. Rid ourselves of all our Māori atua and let's take this new atua on board for this battle. And he tells them, if you do these things, these are the laws of Jehovah. If you do these things in the battle, you'll be victorious. And he says, you cannot eat your, your, um, whoever you kill, which they're still practicing up until those days. You can't take anything off a, off a dead person's body, their, 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 their musket. You can't, um, if they're wounded, you can't finish them off, let their people come and get them. And they set up a stage, and anybody they killed, they hung the bodies on the stage to show Whānaupunui they were not going to eat these people. You know, for a race of people who have been doing this for generations, this is a strange act you know, to watch this in the battle. And throw in a few miracles, that helps people get converted. <laughs> uh, he told them not to do these things. Three people were well known in that battle, young chiefs, to have done those things to have broken those laws. They went into a, an assault on one particular day and a row of 70 of them. They were wearing shirts and they attacked and the pa fired on them. And they were hit by um, musket balls. Only three were killed, those three. And the others were looking at their shirts. They had musket holes through the shirts. Well, you can ma- imagine that, what that does to the Māori mind. How oh, this atua is powerful that he could do that. And the short of it is, is they, they up stakes and they go home and they, they get back to around to the East Coast, find out and want to know, what is this? What has caused all of this? And so they send peace and mysteries around, same thing, two women and a man, a man, and they come around and they ask, what is it that has done this? And virtually, that year, the gospel spreads, uh, the gospel message and that's why in 1838, when Williams, Reverend William Williams comes back and he sees what's happened, they're practicing church on Sundays, they've built chapels. He says that you can't put this down to your missionaries. Uh, he writes in his diaries, this is the work of the hand of the Lord. It's the only thing that can explain it. And uh, sure, there might have been a f- chasing after fashion for a lot of those guys, but I think 
uh, when you read some of what they said, that there was a real change of heart for a lot of those, um, a lot of that generation. I just wanted to talk about how Māori they were in those days too. Kapo Fetu, great story at Waipiro Bay. When William Williams came in 1830, 1840, he uh, baptised a whole lot of uh, people. And this chief, tall, dignified warrior, uh, this, is, this is the relationship of the Williams to Māori in 1840. Kapo Fetu listens to William Williams say to him, uh, OK, sir, when I say, ko au, ko au, when I say, Tazai, Tazai, couple fetu. Uh, sorry, when I say what is your name, you say Tazai, Tazai, couple fetu. And then in Māori, he used to say, Ko o, ko o, ko kapo fetu. And he leans over William Williams and pats him on the head and he says, Pākeha, Pākeha. Ko te ka wau anake e karangana tona ingoa, ko o, ko o. Pākeha, it's only the shag that calls its own name, ko o, ko o. It's just a foreign thing to him to have to say that. Uh, but what it shows you is in 1840, the relationship of Māori to the missionaries at a time when we were the majority uh, in the country. Uh, the 1840s, the impact of the wars up here with Hunehike and in Waido, that all filters back to, to the East Coast because of the relationships that are going on between those, those people. And you, cer you certainly find in the 1840s uh, a peak in about 1846 uh, of the huri hanga o Ngāti Pro That's how we say it, the huri hanga, the turning of Ngāti Pro to Christianity. It's not a wholesale conversion. It's taking Christianity with their own beliefs and shaping what they need for, them, for themselves. It's, it comes down to the, the threat of land being taken in other areas and uh, whenever William says there's a turning away from, from church services, a lot of the times it's got to do with the economic prosperity that followed where they're out in the wheat fields. You know, they say on the East Coast in the 1840s, Urana te whenua i te The place was covered, covered with wheat supplying the Auckland market. In 1841, I think you had the, um, the gold rush in Australia where Auckland was providing for that market as well. So there was a lot of prosperity. Um, in the 1850s and 60s, this resistance to land alienation grows. You have the Kingitanga established. Some of our people decide that might be a better way moving forward. Others want to stay um, aligned to the, to the crown. Because when, um, when William Williams came back in 1840 with the treaty, you've got to remember he'd been up to that time, he'd been to the East Coast three times. He could walk on water as far as Ngāti Pro was concerned because he brought back everybody from, uh, from the north. And that's what Tomata could have told them. This is the man who's responsible, or these missionaries are responsible. And so when he comes in 1840, I believe that the signing of the treaty has got a lot to do with who brought the treaty to them. Uh, why would you distrust this guy to bring you anything um, bad when he hasn't previously? The other thing he did was he introduced to them, even on his first visit, the British flag and got them to understand that the Queen was the mother of the church, but she was also the crown. So as far as us on the, the coast, when they signed that treaty, it was binding. It was, uh, it was like a covenant in the Bible where it's you, the crown, and God. And Māori, my, my uncles told me in the Māori battalion, that's, that's why they went because they had signed this covenant which they couldn't break and that under Article 3 they were bound to. They were bound to serve. And so we have some who fall, fall to the Kingitanga and, um, uh, and they leave to fight over in other places and then you following that in 1865 you have the Pai Marire religion coming and uh, we have a, a, an internal war on the East Coast. A lot of us turn to the Pai Marire faith but, you know, there's a the thing about Māori, they'll turn back, give them a bit of time, and when they lost, they all came back into the Anglican fold. Uh, and then, of course, Te Kōti, and if you know the story of what happened to Te Kōti, and a lot of uh, his people, a lot of our people were followers, can't hardly blame him for what, what went on there. Uh, and so we end up, in 1871, after the pursuit of Te Kōti, we decide that we need to do what we did in the past. We need to find more peaceful ways to survive in this world. And we turn to education. 
And a lot of people are saying Ngāti is in every government department, in every school all over this country. It's because we were a generation ahead of everybody else to get educated. In 1871, Rapata Wahoha <coughs> said, Ngāti Pro, put yourselves to school. This is the future. He went to Australia and he saw what was coming. Uh, and so there was a focus on three things, your culture, and that's your marae, on your church, uh, which in our area is the Anglican church, and on education. That's where the investment went from the 1870s onwards. And you know, I have to acknowledge that those generations who did all of that because you know, I'm a product of it. And you know, that whole Christian message coming right back to here, to pai here, comes down my whakapapa line and, and reaches me. So I have that to be thankful for. Weonora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou koutou.